Okay, so hi everybody, and welcome to Indelible's 2023 Grand Poetry Finale. So this is officially the last event uh, for Indelible and the LABRC in general to take place in 2023. Um, and ever since, speaking of 2023, ever since the birth of the LABRC on December 15, 2022, so we're officially one year old right now. So we just turned one a few days ago. And ever since then, uh, 2023 has been a year bursting with never-ending creativity, especially if we zoom in on our most recent issue of Indelible, thanks to everyone who contributed with poetry, art, prose, reviews, and anything lovely and creative. Um, and our issue, as you may know, was on the theme of science and sensibility. Uh, that was issue number seven. It came out in June, and you could still read it if you haven't done so yet on our website, www.indeliblelit.com. Uh, and for me, um, personally, this was, Indelible was a miracle baby. Um, I know I mentioned this before in my editor's notes, but this issue uh, came after juggling so many things amidst the din and crush of moving continents because I've only been in London for a year and a couple of months. I moved from Dubai to London um, at the end of July 2022, and uh, Indelible had been there before. So Indelible was born in 2019 before the LABRC. Um, and we already had people submitting their poems and all that had to be kept on hold for a few months until, you know, until we could settle in a bit. Um, so, you know, there was the endless tasks of boxing and unboxing, living out of suitcases and hotel rooms before dwelling with cardboard boxes again at home and receiving our furniture from Dubai, um, settling in, finding a school, finding the furniture that we did not have. Uh, and then, of course, establishing the LABRC, which took a lot of time. So all while meeting many writing and editorial deadlines also that had to be put on hold during the time of this huge and significant transition. So there was a point when, I must admit, um, I felt quite overwhelmed by the flood of submissions. Um, they were all wonderful, but I had to choose from over 1,062 oh. submissions. That's how many we had. Oh. That was huge. And, um, you know, that was by October 31st, 2022. And then we kept receiving. I mean, we're still receiving things for science and sensibility up until today, although the submissions window is closed. Yeah. But you can imagine how lucky you are if you submitted I mean, and your name is up there on Indelible because, I mean, it must have been something really fantastic. So thank you all and bravo to everybody who made it there. Um, and uh, those of you who have experienced the Big Bang, to use a scientific term, of creativity, you're probably familiar with the profound renewal of energy and order that emerges from chaos. So everything was chaotic around me, but we managed to muster up the courage and the time and the will in order to bring out indelible science and sensibility. So again, I'm quoting Carl Jung. As many of you know, I am a Jungian as well, um, that in every chaos, there is a cosmos and in all disorder is a secret order. So thank you for being part of this lovely secret order. And the issue, um, as you may know, featured brilliant writers, poets, artists, and scientists from many different backgrounds. And everybody shared their ingenious creative renditions of the universe. Neuroscientists, mathematicians, physicists, psychologists, medical practitioners, chemists, biologists, STEM researchers, science fans, and just artistic and creative aficionados of science. So as you can see, whatever the science, you name it, we had it. And within the pages of indelible number seven, our innovative contributors offered so much work that creatively explored the interplay of light, viruses, cooking, soil, cells, plants, consciousness, chemicals, astronomy, uh, math. So there was so much to savor in the original uh, works that were submitted to indelible number seven. We also held a science and sensibility conference in September, and hopefully we'll be having another one again in 2024. 
Um, and the one that we had this year brought together, again, a wonderful group of poets featuring keynote speakers, Jack Cooper, Omar Sabah, and Indelible also featured <clears throat> Chun Yu, who is on the cover of uh, Indelible number no. seven. Um, the conference emerged as a dynamic event, fostering the rich transdisciplinarity and uh, discussions and creative explorations at the intersection of science and the arts, which is a very important topic to the LABRC, joining the arts and the humanities with the rest of the hard sciences. And uh, tonight we will be celebrating our Pushcart Prize nominee poets who have so generously shared with us some captivating poetry in this issue. Uh, all poems that drew inspiration from the cosmos, from psychology, physics, chemistry, biology, and technology. And uh, we will commence this wonderful event with our brilliant guest poet, Shadab Ziz Hashimi, joining us all the way from San Diego. Uh, and then we will continue with the Pushcart nominees, Derek Davidson, Fiona Beckett, Italo Ferrante, Sam Zamrik, and Ioana Jika. And uh, remember to be inspired is to remain open to the wealth of knowledge surrounding us, to embrace heightened awareness of the world, both inside and within, allowing us to appreciate the countless instances in which the universe offers inspiration for creation, especially through science. So uh, we want to invite you all to enjoy this lovely front row seat in front of your laptops and phones and enjoy the beauty of the poetry tonight. And without further ado, we would like to start now with our featured guest poet, Shadab, who will be treating us with her poems for the first 20 minutes. And Shadab, I'm just going to pin your screen here so everybody can see you. And the floor is yours. Hi, greetings from San Diego. I am so happy to be among you and so honored, Rula, for inviting me to read. Um, happy birthday, LABRC. It's it's quite an accomplishment. It's uh, it's amazing to be part of it. I was able to attend a conference in London, and then I was part of a conference recently. Um, it's it's a fantastic. Uh, community, so thank you, and indelible. Of course, I uh, look forward to reading to hearing everybody's poems. So I'm going to begin with a poem right now. As you know, is an important part of the year. This is a time to celebrate, to be with family and friends, but it's also we're also in the midst of a genocide, and Palestine is on our minds. So I'm going to open with a poem that I wrote recently. It's called Witness. The eye of history never sleeps. It sweeps you in, Adam, Atom. So you happen again and again to return as a body part bearing witness in the slaughter fields that were golden groves in another time. Your ear of its own accord bears witness to the blast, the whetted shrapnel, the cries of mothers that lacerate the heavens. Your eyes bear witness to the ocean of white shrouds that was 30 days ago a city, a hundred years ago a jewel of the Eastern Mediterranean. Your feet lead you nightly in your dank cavernous dream where you are so small, you know your mother by scent alone and father by the muscular crook of his arm. Here you are, washed up on the shore of primal remembrance, an infant among infants, sweet and blind and held together by love alone until a house, a hospital, an apartment building collapses on you, until your neck is squeezed between metal rod and concrete and body parts of the universe that were once your father and mother. 
except for the sorcerers of your countrymen sharpening knives to sacrifice one people over another people, there is dead silence. The eye of history is a camera that does not shudder and go dark after a bombing. You remain in the middle of its crosshairs. The eye of history dangles over your morning coffee, waiting for your tongue to finally bear witness. So uh, I'm going to share a couple of poems from a uh, from my first book. It's called Baker of Tarifa. It came out about 12 years ago. And it's based on uh, research, um, research of the history of uh, Al-Andalus, which is also known as Muslim Spain. It was a near millennium of um, Muslim presence in Europe, Muslims in the West. So it's important in all kinds of ways, um, this period of history. The most important aspect is that it's a period known as La Convivencia or the peaceful coexistence. And um, while I was doing research, it was uh, uh, it was uh, important to do to think about this period in time because of the wars that were going on twenty years ago, and this remains relevant. I'm going to read a poem called "The End of the War," and um, this book is uh, has four sections. The first section is about the Convivencia period where there was a, a peaceful coexistence between the Abrahamic people. The second one is when the conflicts began to arise. The third one is the about the Inquisition and the collapse of the uh, of the civilization. And uh, the the last section um, is is just notes, historical notes. So I'm going to read this poem that's in the voice of a fictional character in the book. The End of the War. I entered the city gates in a blindfold, led by nothing but the summer drift of fairy roses, the secret musk of books. How the market puffed up with flags and shrouds. For a few drachmas, I bought a shroud for my sword and buried it un under the bitter almond tree. Next, I bought a pail of azaleas, a lamp and a saffron mantilla, wrapped in which all night I watched ink silently make sparrows of its dormant language. Morning broke on the page I was reading and I let words fall into tightly woven nests, and I let illumination be the song. And I'm gonna read one more poem from this book. And this book, this poem is called The Stonemason's Son Contemplates Death. And it's based on this, um, uh, this um, uh, custom that they had in Alandolos. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more. This is a period between 711 and 1492. And many of you are aware of this history. Um, I think um, people living in the UK are more aware of this history than people in the, living in the US. Uh, but so 711 and 1492, and um, the, the book retraces this whole history in, the, you know, in, in a series of poems. And some of the characters are actual figures from this history and uh, some of them are fictional. So this is in the voice of a fictional character and he's um, his this he's the stonemason's son. Why stonemason? Because we know that this place is known for beautiful architecture and one of the customs um, was to build a well in public buildings. So in front of hospitals and, you know, palaces, public squares, and even in houses, they used to have these wells. And the wells would have a prayer um, sort of addressed to the people who would drink from the well and would have sort of like a blessing carved, you know, on these tiles so the stonemason, therefore the stonemason who would make the, the, the tiles. 
And so this sun, this is the time of the Inquisition. This is where this poem is set. And um, the sun is contemplating death. Because my heart became a kin, I wished to die. The inscription on the tiles made a prayer in butterfly script crowning your well. May the water refresh your soul. The clanging of keys became loud. A soldier stood behind me pissing in the well. Someone sang in the distance, couldn't tell if she was a Jew, Christian, or Muslim. It was a devotional song. And uh, I'm going to read a few love poems today. This is my most recent. I'm going to read my newest poems. You know, uh, just, so the, these poems, short lyrics that are sort of inspired by Sufi poetry. So this first one is called Love Poem Carried by the Hoopoe. And the hoopoe bird is, as some of you may know, it's um, an archetype of a um, messenger. It's a messenger between lovers, and it's also a messenger between God and inspired people. So um, um, this, uh, so love poem carried by the hoopoe. It's, it's shadow curling, crossing milky ways, lunar cuts, craters, ice, and oceans of dust. For us shorebirds, with no fine crest or velvet flight, just the formula of love and veins, exact ratios between each other's wingtips, trills, intuiting light in fractions and winds directions, we fly low and long, turn for joys folded with aches in proportion, turn seasons from burnt nests to gold leaf pages, our poem in mythic talons above. And this one is also a love poem, less, uh, less mystic, but uh, this poem is, uh, is, is, this is for all exiles, you know, if, all people who are living in the diaspora. Warp and weft. How we met in the lilt and nectary of the typed word, how air wove itself into spring around our screens and snapped timetables and turned us from panic to song, spinning the counterfeit back into gold handing us to each other a filament at a time, which we gathered along with the shed hair of love's ghosts to weave a home. We sat for lessons from hummingbirds that shape a cup from twigs and shiny grasses, a nest just big enough to raise their jeweled young, camouflaged with chips of lichen and bark. Shakarhora. Hummingbird in Urdu means sugar devourer. God gives sugar, as the saying goes, to the devourer of sugar. Won't it be the same for love? I cup my hands wide enough for the seven kinds of jasmines you grow, or, or half a magnolia, or a single bitter gourd. Limits are to be kissed. The warbler marks its territory with song, and a country of sweet echoes is born, a mythos of whistle, rasp, chirp. Ours is a song of the loom with the warp and weft of old country and new. We not the terrestrial with the lingual, the lost with the cumulus, such as ribbons of seaweed with fibers of photos, plumes of hill manas with pulped passports, we rock in the burnt boats of our own embroidery. Rula, this poem reminds me of your story of how you moved and <laughs> all the chaos that happened and all the order that had, be, had to be built around the chaos or from the chaos. Here's another love poem. And this is based on the story from the Book of Kings from the ancient Persian Shahnameh. And there's a little footnote and I'll share that. The lover's chisel 
in a, le in a legend from the ancient Persian masterpiece, The Book of Kings, the sculptor Farhad digs a mountain for a lake of milk to win Shireen's hand. Both lovers die tragically in the process. In Sufi poetry, a mirror symbolizes access to the Supreme Beloved. So this poem is called Love Poem Balanced Between a Mountain and a Mouth. Love poem balanced between a mountain and a mouth loaded with slick beads, waiting at lance point for words to pay the ransom, to thread the mind's splinter that will embroider the flummoxed universe, to pour honey over marble towns and fill the promised lake with milk. The lover's chisel carves and carves for that flickering moth, that mirror swallowed by stone his wild heart beats beyond the hour he will tumble to death pursued by the mountain's blood echoes of mirrors struck and this next one is a love poem balanced between your shoulder blades and it's based on the idea this is um uh, this is a sort of muslim lore that there are uh, two angels on your shoulders and one of them on the right side writes down all the good things that you do and the other one writes down all the bad things sort of like santa claus love poem balanced between two shoulder blades where two angels play seesaw never losing sight of you one on each silk floss wing you dip in ink fingers jammed in the moonlit sarcophagus of poetry Lips sealed with tannin, tar, and a longing that splits your chest in two, meter and rhyme asunder. Angels have no way of knowing your thoughts. Their heads, perhaps soft and plumed or angled like pruning scissors, have remained bowed over your life scroll since the moment of your birth. Angels, poets without tongues, Imagine nothing save the vile, doleful, or ravishing that shakes you to the core from which they measure less than three quarters of a foot each. The unseen gleam of your breastbone, they sleep, drink, dance, light, are made to extinguish side by side with you after the hours blow away like a hurricane of lies, after the rhapsody of your life has pierced angel-sized tears in their report to the divine. And um, one of my books, one of my five books is about the ghazal. It's, uh, the ghazal is a poetic form. It is uh, originally from um, the, the Arab culture, the Arab, it's an Arabic tradition and it moved from, uh, from one tradition to another over time, over hundreds of years. And for the past um, more than half a century, we've been writing the ghazal in English. So my book is about what the tradition is, what the poetic form is, and how it's a little bit about the history of the form, but also it's uh, the book is sort of like a love uh, letter to all languages because it's 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 about what's at the heart of language itself, and and love poetry. Ghazal is a, a, a love ode originally, and even now after having gone through uh, its Persian iteration and Urdu and English, and it's been written in German and Spanish and Turkish and many other languages. It still it is has still retained its um, place as an important uh, form of love lyric, a love ode. So I'm going to read a ghazal that's written in the form, and you'll hear hear a refrain and an internal rhyme. And the poem has couplets, and the standard ghazal will have a minimum of five couplets. Um, and uh, the theme is uh, the apocalypse. I've been writing some apocalypse poems. I'm going to share one more after this. So um, uh, the refrain here is a little. So you'll hear that with every end of the couplet. So and and then there, the since we're among poets, I'm also sharing that the internal rhyme. I usually don't. The internal rhyme is perfume so you'll hear um sorry kills 
So kills is, is the internal rhyme and the refrain is a little. Pouncing from screen to retina, cyber ray kills a little. Pouncing from screen to retina, cyber ray kills a little. Avoid soot, plastic, beware, even perfume kills a little. I'm reading it in the traditional Urdu style, so you'll hear me repeat the first line of each couplet. This spring, neither crocuses, peonies, nor primroses arrived. This spring, neither crocuses, peonies, nor primroses arrived. Only the Toulouse goose quawks and tailor bird trills a little. How we walk to the oldest feud or kiss thrown by the sun. How we walk to the oldest feud or kiss thrown down by the sun. How broke backs to split atoms labor the soil till a little. The planet reeks of ink, blood games of the times dressed as language. This is the Times, the newspaper. The planet reeks of ink, blood games of the times dressed as language. What bounties hubris will sponge, poetry will refill a little. And in this last couplet, you'll hear my, it's a signature couplet, so you'll hear my name. Zeast in the chill of the universe's amaranthine night. Zeast in the chill of the universe's amaranthine night. Let one skipped beat, your human sputter and spark, thrill a little. Rula, are we doing okay time-wise? Uh, yes, Shadab, you still have a minute left. So okay. you're good for one more. Okay, okay. So I'm going to end with a, uh, this poem called Exploded Ghazal in the Land of the Prophets. So this is a ghazal, this poem wanted to be a ghazal. So it had a refrain, but then it was also resisting to be forced into, to be beaten into submission. And so I call it Exploded Ghazal in the Land of the Prophets. And this is for Gaza. Scripture of crushed rib cages lies under rubble in the land of the prophets. So small, the body parts strewn on sidewalks, threaded into shards. Anything shiny in the ash was once a child in the land of the prophets. Hourly, the bombs go off. All birdsong calls to prayer slip into the smallest body bags in the land of the prophets. The screams are human, the soundless gasps from debris and incubators too. The convulsions of mothers shake the firmament in the land of the prophets. Explosions go on ripping apart child after child in playgrounds, pediatric cancer unit, park, in mosque, church, bus, in alley, apartment, refugee camp. No place is a safe place in the land of the prophets. After the explosions, tiny shrouds like snow flurries fill the skies, come down to speak the truth in the land of the prophets. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Adab. Um, That was very powerful. And uh, thank you so much for sharing it with everyone. And uh, also I, really loved uh, the books that you read from. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have two, Ghazal Cosmopolitan and The Baker of Tarifa. Uh, they're very cultural, very historical, very spiritual. So Shadab's work is just amazing, poetic inquiry and arts-based research, you know, at its best. And thank you so much, Shadab, for echoing the world such in such a beautiful manner. Thank you. Thanks, Rula. Thank you, everyone. Oh, and Shadab, I forgot to introduce you. So let me read Shadab's bio. Um, right. Okay, so Shadab Ziz Tashmi is a Pakistani-American poet and essayist, the winner of the San Diego Book Award, Sable's Hybrid Book Prize, the Nazim Hikmet Poetry Prize, and has been nominated for the Pushcart multiple times. 
Shadab's work engages with history, cultures of encounter, the life of the spirit, and aesthetics. She has presented in literary festivals, museums, academic institutes, and conferences across the country and abroad. Her books include two poetry collections, Coal and Chalk and Baker of Tarifa, and a volume of prose and poetry titled Ghazal Cosmopolitan, which has been praised by Marilyn Hacker as a marvelous interweaving of poetry, scholarship, literary criticism, and memoir. Her latest book is Kong, a hybrid memoir about growing up in Peshawar, the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan during the Soviet War. Comb is a rumination on border, borders and the larger historical, literary, and cultural encounters across the ancient Silk Road, of which Peshawar was a significant outpost. Shadav's poetry has been translated into Spanish, Turkish, Bosnian, and Urdu, and has appeared in numerous anthologies and journals worldwide, most recently in McSweeney's In the Shape of a Human Body, I'm Visiting the Earth, and The Best Asian Poetry 2021. She has taught in the MFA program at San Diego State University as a writer in residence, and her work has been included in the language arts curriculum for grades 7 to 12, Asian American and Pacific Islander women poets, as well as college courses in creative writing and the humanities. And I apologize again, Shada, for uh, missing to read this earlier. But thank That's you so awesome. much. Awesome. Great honor having you with us today, Shada, and always, as ever. The honor thank is you. Mine. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, now, Derek, are you ready? Yeah, I guess so. All right, Derek, let me share your poem. I'm going to uh, okay. read it. Okay, here it is. So um, I'll introduce Derek. Derek Davidson is an assistant professor at Appala Appalachian State University. Previously, he was Associate Artistic Director and resident company member at the Barter Theater in Virginia. His solo piece, Furrow, had its NYC premiere in 2020 as part of the NYC New Works Festival. His short play, Blackjack, has been performed internationally as part of the 2019 Climate Change Theater Action and was subsequently published as part of Lighting the Way, an anthology of short plays about the climate crisis. Most recently, his play Talk Back premiered at The Tank in August of 2022 in New York City. And Derek, again, it is a great honor to have you with us on board another LABRC activity. And this is the screen that I would like to share. Can you all see it? So you will be able to see Derek's poem as he is reading it. Okay, Derek, it's all yours. Thank you for the introduction. I'm honored and uh, just really this, this whole, being part of this extraordinary group of people is surreal to me, but anyway. This is the poem, uh, and I'll read it. Bouquet at the End of the Universe. The 18th century still life that is the bouquet on our kitchen counter lets fly a tuft of petals, thrown, jettisoned as if the rest of the bunch had simply had it with them. Did I see and hear this enactment of tiny ruin, or did there fall out a seconds before move my head to witness the effects and not the act? And no other movement or sound but the stolid house hum, its whispered continuance even when we don't notice. And a building register among the quiet, not sound, but the approach of it, the sound nothing makes before the blast of arrival. Then what I hear, or imagine, inhabiting some farness ahead, Benjamin's angel rush, equilibrium fixing things or not, slowing the star burns, calming the air streams into another silence. This one, after all celestial bodies have exhausted any possible way of noise, when cold has muted the buzzing of quarks and smaller things all, all. So peremptory is the second law, and there are no more pedals and no counters to receive them, that sound which no eardrum anywhere shall catch. Might some greater eye mark and hold dear our universal acts, register as in a musty ledger our effects? Had we any? 
and were there in that nothing dark, how see? Thank you, Derek. Would you like to read something else? No, I I didn't know I was supposed to. Uh, I just had had that. I, I I'm sorry. I didn't know the protocol. Oh, that's fine. No, that's fine. If you would like to only, so it's yeah. You don't have to. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for having me. Um, and now we move to Fiona's poem. So hello, Fiona. Let me just pull this out. Okay, here it is. It's a very beautiful poem visually as well. Um, Fiona Beckett works at the University of Leeds and is currently writing a book on visual poetry by women. She's interested in poetry on and off the page, in non-human environments, as well as poetry in virtual or expanded reality. She recently published an article on electronic poetry in Judith, Women Making Visual Poetry, edited by Amanda Earle. Uh, Fiona, it is a great honor to have you with us today and uh, to hear you read your poem for the very first time, I believe, right? Indeed, yes. Thank you, Rula. Thank you. This is entirely your fault that I'm here at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, actually, I'm really thankful to you, Rula, um, and I, uh, just for making this evening possible um, and for Thank being you, so... Fiona. Well, you've been so positive about my poem. Um, I feel in awe of the company I'm keeping, I have to say, this evening. I am in awe. Um, and we've already heard some truly wonderful poetry, and maybe there'll be time later to ask some questions. I don't know, but um, both poets uh, preceding me are, are, are fantastic. So I'll, I'll just say... Um, a few words about this poem. I've only got one poem, really, because I, I didn't know the protocol either, but um, it is, um, this is Vivisected Girl, and it is from a series of poems um, which I've sort of sat on and worked on for for quite a while now. Um, they were prompted by um, my experience of the declining mental health of somebody very close to me, my child, in fact, and 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 our experience of of what in the UK is a horribly underfunded and beleaguered um, mental health service, um, especially for neurodiverse children and adolescents. Um, it's I would say this service is in a crisis, um, and it's something we kind of know, but when when mental health problems affect those we love, you suddenly know it in a different way, don't you? So that was the prompt to writing this poem, but I also wanted the poem to have some structural integrity. Um, I'm very interested in visual poetry, as, as Rula has said, and there's a small element of that um, in my poem. Um, every thought of it though starts with language um, and with certain sounds and certain rhythms, which I hope um, supplement and, and complement the imagery. Um, and I haven't read it aloud before, and I'm not used to reading poetry to anybody except myself and my mother, who, who actually did cry when I read her this. And I said, it's not that bad, surely. Um, <laughs> anyway, so here we go. Vivisected Girl. A poet might write your arms shine birch bark silvered o'er livid flesh tense through tight skin slits but to me you are the vivisected girl how objective you are filming your self dissection to upload where pairing skin fat and veins with such gaping concentration. You ache to know, will the tender blade nestle in the shivered V? After bleach cocktails and paracetamol swallowed like palmer violets on a walk in the park, you are interred. You call it cheerfully the nut house, vivisectioned, you might say, with your love of gallows humour. My vivisected girl, 
burst skin in bloody frets, down biceps to filmy knuckles, and you carved your elegy in your thigh, weirdo, in uppercase cuts. Wow, thank you for sharing such a powerful and beautiful poem, Fiona, combining the science of psychology with your maternal feelings and, and all that together. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rula. Thank, thank you, Rula. Thank you. So uh, as you said, Fiona, yes, we will be having some time for questions later on. So yeah, we could all ask and, and comment on the poems in a bit. Uh, right. So uh, coming up next is Italo. Hello, Italo. Uh, let me just get your poem and oh, it's, introduce it's you. I can also it's use my screen, use screen, 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 screen because I've got a lot of other people to read. So. Okay. So you want to use your own screen? Yeah, that's if that's fine. Yeah. yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so Italo Ferrante earned a BA in English Literature and Creative Writing from the University of Warwick. He is currently undertaking an MA in Creative Writing at Lancaster University. To date, his work has been selected for publication by Train River, Nymphs and Thugs, Drake, Queer Zine, Flash Journal, Reinvention, Poetry Salzburg, Impossible Archetype, Cardiff Review, and Orker Lee Press. Thank you so much for joining us today, Italo. Um, it's going to be a wonderful joy and honor hearing you read your poems. So without further ado, please take it away. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so can I ask if it's still possible to use up the 10 minutes law uh, or not? Yeah, yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah, of course. That's okay. fine. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, so let me just share my screen. Right, so before I start reading my poems, because all of my set is going to deal quite heavily with this ordered eating, so just a heads up in advance because it's a bit graphic and intense in that respect. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Number and is the poem that was selected by Indelible and is nominated for the Pushcart Prize. Number. The day starts to wear piecemeal and catabolic, like a number split to the smallest primes. The digits you chop add up to the food you factor. Mirrors reflect zero. Wheeze and shuffle round off the shock value. Bare torso selfies remind you that a diet is repeated subtraction. Scales mark minus infinity. A mass with no body repels gravity. Why did you convert matter into thin air? Heavier than heaven. I dream of a body at rest forever. It's mine. I recognize its angular mass of lamps and knots, how it collapses inwards when I don't pipe feed it. I catch my spine, losing another tussle with gravity. I suck in my stomach as far as I can. My calorie countdown reminds me I'm one fast away from mathematical beauty. The police tape across the refrigerator keeps sugar out of my addition tables. White light is the sum of all colours except me. I curse the star that was kind enough to burst and breed me. Let me spew my guts into space until I become weightless. Just going to scroll down. The next one is called Fast Yearning Bursts. My love is so big, it could bend light. It could revamp the shriveled husk of a dead star. It's the reason why protons stick together. It's the opposite of discrete packets of energy. I could move to a blue planet. I could live in a lake on an island in a lake on an island, as long as you're there. My love would craft moonets in vain. You like the undersea better than my sandpaper tongue. My love exists 
in a tense of probability, fast, perfect, and continuous. You may call it quantum entanglement or some spooky action at a distance, like licking the tip of your nose inside a quarantine station. The impossibility of knocking my hands into yours lifts me crisscross by railway lines. My atoms jump from trains in motion. I beg you to shoot my particles through a slit window. I ask you to play husband and wife with me, to give me a monkey scrub if I tease you like honey curling back on itself. Please stop looking for ways to outgrow me. You're the reason why the earth will run out of auroras. Squint at the canyon-shaped hole my love has hatched on the sun. It's for you, the lover I've never had. Um, so those three were um, three poems that were mostly informed by my experience of disorder eating and my um, interest in science, mathematics and physics. Uh, the next uh, poem I'm going to read is more of a longer piece and this time I'm mostly looking at disordered eating, eating through the lenses of grammar since I'm also a full-time TAFL teacher and it's called The Grammar of Starving. The present tenses remind me that starving is both a state and an action. I don't eat and I'm not eating, both are correct. I'm seeing my heart pulsate in my eyes as I'm writing this. Now, right now. I'm not hating my body. I'm hating the vocabulary of eating. Nibbling, biting, chewing, munching, devouring. The hard cheese of gobbling, gorging, gulping. The mechanics of mastication. The socially accepted rituals. Having breakfast, having brunch, having lunch, having a snack, having dinner, having tea, having supper, having another snack. Taking in food, not taking in food, choosing not to stuff my face. Overthinking, swallowing, from bolus to stool, from daily stool to no stool. Eating crow, eating humble pie, eating my heart out. Eating words, never eating myself out of house and home, but always back inside. I'm being silly according to my mum. I have starved myself. The action started in the past, but I don't need to say when. The action is still affected the present. Evidence, head, lighter than hydrogen, spine, Z-shaped, blood, warm but sugar deficient, stomach, too empty to ache, bowel movements, rare, gut reflex, volcanic, sex drive, nail, attention span, shorter than a fruit fly, sleep quality, melatonin, substance addiction, melatonin, spirituality, melatonin. Over the past 28 days, how many times have you made yourself sick vomit as a means of controlling your weight or shape? Next question, please. How many times have you made yourself sick vomit as a means of controlling your weight or shape? I said next question. How many times have you taken laxatives as a means of controlling your weight or shape? Please don't tell my mom. How many times have you exercised in a driven or compulsive way as a means of controlling your weight, shape or amount of fat or to burn off calories? Please don't tell anyone. The present perfect continuous focuses on the duration of the action. The present perfect simple focuses on the results of the action. I have been losing sleep, weight, friends, weight, valuables, consciousness, boners, teeth, toenails, fingernails, cuticles, too much hair, gallstones, subscriptions, library books, more weight, bearings, passcodes, emergency numbers, God, my boyfriend, touch, sight, colour, things I now miss. I've lost it. The fast perfect. The fast perfect only admits the overthinking interrogative. The fast perfect is, was, and will always be irregular. The fast perfect comes earlier than your thoughts. The fast perfect wants your wishes and hypotheses. The fast perfect keeps the present imperfect. The fast perfect is not the background for the main action. The fast perfect is the main action. 
plus size rugby shirts, plus kids calling me fat bomb, plus lies about my parents feeding me pig's milk, plus mom telling me I had big bones, plus eating milk or bars for breakfast, plus not being held in the arms of an adult, plus trust falls ended in a nose split, plus burned lasagna tops, plus stuffed pizza crusts, plus lasagna made of stacked pizza crusts, plus juice, plus coke, plus juice and coke, plus teenagers say I'll never get married, plus not getting changed before or after PE, plus only going to DC after dusk, plus treating virginity like a disease, plus spending pocket money on obscure Oreos, plus spending weekends like weekdays, plus panty girdles for young men, plus tips to manifest thinness, plus hunger is all in your head, plus hair, water, sleep are enough, plus fit people, fit fit people, plus the mirror loves you, the future you, plus the future you mirrors the perfect you, plus the perfect you shops in the children's section, plus the fork, plus the spoon, plus the knife, minus the food. Promise one. I will forget the number of calories in a tablespoon of olive oil. Offer. I will help myself carry the groceries by rebuilding muscle mass. Refusal. I won't wash Kit Kats under hot water anymore. Promise two. I will hit the chocolate coating from now on. Instant decision. I will stop this immature attention-seeking thing. Prediction. I will have bread, tuna and lots of pasta like Harry Styles. Prediction, I will have the energy to go to a Harry Styles concert. Prediction, I will feel like Harry when I wear my red satin shirts and tight suit pants. Prediction, I will feel okay when Harry notices my hairy skin is self in the crowd. Delusional hope, Harry will find me, Harry will feel me, Harry will free me. Holy Harry, full of grace, pray for me. I can let it go, I can let it go, I can let it go. I will, I am, I have. I will get better, 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 I will get better. I will not relapse, 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 I will relapse. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Wow, thank you so much, Italo. That was a very rich bouquet of poetic articulations of the 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 the, the problem of eating disorders, but it's such an amazing way how you explored it and how you brought it out and expressed it to everyone. Thank you. And uh, right now I will uh, welcome Sam. Hello, Sam. And uh, Sam will be reading to us the poem Cyborg. Sam Zemrik is a queer Syrian poet, translator, and political educator in exile in Berlin, Germany. Sam is co-founder of Damascus University's first ever poetry club and has taken part and given performances in several panel discussions on poetry, language, and politics at key Berlin venues and universities, such as Humboldt University, Bard College Berlin, Literature House Berlin, House of World Cultures, and the Vokes Theater Berlin. Sam's debut poetry collection, I Am Not, published by Hanser Berlin Publishing House, has received the inaugural Wonderblock Award by the Wonderblock Foundation. And it is great honor that we have you with us tonight, Sam. And without further ado, I'm going to ask you to take it away, and I will share your screen. Thank you so much, Rula. Um, it's always a pleasure and an honor um, to be among you and to hear such great voices. Um, these are such tough acts to follow, um, but I will try my best, beginning with Cyborg, and then afterwards I will read another poem if time allows. Um, Cyborg. Two worlds tear at me each with their own places and faces and milestones. To my left, little greenlings grow, and though they live in different little pots and little huts, they sway all the same with the winds that forewarn of the coming war creeping. To my right, an earful of content and an eyeful of binary air that spares neither digit nor point from its cunning cloud. It counts and foretells aloud. It needs light into forecasts and commands an army of gratis corpses. I use both to stand, to extend my hand, 
to earn my bread and to feed my head. How long will either last? And if I may, um, I would like to read a poem from my book, I Am Not. Um, and this one is my attempt at mixing political sciences with the um, experience of exile. And it's called Mouth Shit. I am excluded from the body of human rights, for I am no human. I am its excretion when it is ill and cannot see what ails it. This forms my foreignness and my brownness insofar I cannot wash either away. Because I must make home this state, I hide and wet myself in its tongue with euphonious words until I am either heard or excreted again. I am the Leviathan's feces. When I am evacuated, I get eaten up right after. Such is the cycle of my life. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Sam, for these brilliant poems. And um, of course, we will be discussing them in a bit. Um, Joanna, uh, is Joanna here? I, yes, I see, I see you there, Joanna. Hello, can you hear us? Hello, okay, maybe you want to need some, um, more time to get ready. So, in the meantime, I will, um, use the slot. So, we will switch slots with Joanna and I'll read one of my poems. It was actually published recently in the Calendula Review. And, uh, well, the poem was not actually written very recently. It was written during the pandemic, during lockdown. And um, that's when everything was dark. Not that it isn't anymore, but <laughs> um it was the beginning of this whole process of what is this pandemic um, to vaccine or not to vaccine. The vaccine was still theoretically um, an idea. And um, yeah, I mean, people were living in darkness. But then again, the science of darkness is very intriguing because darkness, although it is usually perceived negatively, um, darkness is a very pregnant state of being. Uh, darkness is creative. Uh, many things grow in the dark, many things emerge in the dark, and they cannot emerge otherwise. And many of those things are good things. And um, it's funny how this whole idea came when I was eating eggplants. Uh, an eggplant is a nightshade fruit. Tomatoes are nightshade fruits. Zucchinis are also nightshade fruits. Capsicums. So yeah, some fruits and vegetables, they grow in the dark. So there must be something very fertile about it. So this poem is called Meditations on a Nightshade Fruit. And I am trying to find it here. Um, on the journal. Okay. Sorry, the cocooning of a nightshade fruit. Right, and here it is. In the night's shade, let me grow, like the fetus of this darkness, into the plumpness of an eggplant, the fullness of a tomato, and the piquancy of pepper. Pick me up at dawn when the light parks out. I'll be ready then to glisten in shades of plum and crimson in the lush brushed hair of Morpheus. I shine in shades of amethyst. I'll nourish with secrets learned in lightlessness. Tell tales of my budding, of cracking the code when no one was looking, pipe dreaming while Nessun dorma. So thank you very much. And uh, this was a very short poem. Uh, Joanna, are you there? 
Hello? <laughs> okay, so I guess we can open the floor for questions and comments now. We have around half an hour to do that. But first of all, I wanna thank everyone, Shadab, Sam, Derek, Fiona, and Italo for being here and sharing their brilliant, brilliant poetic takes on the scientific aspects of life so artistically, so creatively, so beautifully. Um, there are some comments in the chat box, as I can see. If you have any questions and you prefer to use the chat box, please do that. If not, then just unmute yourself and say whatever you want. So any questions so far? Okay, hey, thank you, Derek. Thank you. Yes, indeed. This is a remarkable group of artists here. And since nobody has a question right now, um, oh, Derek, you have a question. Yes. yes okay, great. Uh, it's actually, yes. Uh, thanks again to everyone. Oh, man, I'm just uh, humbled. I wonder, you know, uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, s s scraps of the table of extraordinary talent here. But um, uh, I have a question in particular. Uh, for Fiona, if that's all right. Um, <clears throat> I loved your poem, and I just wonder, um, could you explain why, uh, forgive the uh, the simplistic question, but um, why did you shape the poem that way? What what was the it extended uh, meaning behind that? I often find visual poetry um, gets sidelined, you know. Um, it's not often published or given a very high um, uh, profile. Um, and I don't think my poem is a visual poem in the pure sense, but I needed a, a, a form which showed a kind of decline, I suppose, a stepping down, a, a falling, something like that, but a kind of a controlled falling. Um, and I was also aware that when that was laid out on the page, the um, the negative space forms the shape of a a, a sort of blade, uh, a craft blade. And I was thinking of objects that I've had to encounter in in this in, in the context of this illness, and um, I felt that there was perhaps a point in the poem where I could stop the falling you know stop the decline and and move into a a more linear form which i was is a as kind of an echo really of what i hope will happen you know that some sort of more familiar order will will take place so th that's it really i mean it's as it's as, as kind of basic as that actually <laughs> no thank you that makes perfect sense and i'm imagining uh, the shape of it and that, that makes sense thank you Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful, Fiona. I love how you said that you felt that you could stop the decline and move into the more linear. So when you're writing poetry like this, um, besides that it reflects certain thoughts and and what's going on in your heart, in your mind, with your loved ones. So does it make you, does it does it feel therapeutic? I mean, does it heal something? Does it soothe anything? I think, um, I think it's a way of saying what I can't say aloud really, to to anyone mm -hmm. involved with this, um, mm -hmm. and I I can't get into the mind of anyone else. I can only, I, I I'm a kind of active bystander in all this, really. Um, mm -hmm. and so it, it's really just a way of articulating what I could see and, 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 um, if, if anyone is, um, entangled with, with somebody they love deeply, who's in, um, a sort of self-destructive mode, they'll know that it is a relentless illness, um, it doesn't come and go in phases. It it just continues and continues and continues until the person who's suffering most um, does the most extraordinary things. I mean, extraordinarily self-destructive things that kind of go beyond 
reason and and I can't inhabit that and I wouldn't want to inhabit that but I think poems poetry for me is is a way of kind of sorting out giving some order to what seems as you said at the beginning incredibly chaotic yeah all right that's so beautifully put Fiona thank you so much for sharing that um for those of you who are not with us backstage um Professor Fiona Beckett was my thesis supervisor, uh, my PhD thesis supervisor, and um, the project was actually on alchemy in, in poetry. I mean, that's very simply put. It's a lot more complex than that. Um, but Fiona, is there a, a sort of alchemy to it? Because now you say, you know, there's the disorder, the chaos, and trying to deal with it. Is it alchemical in that sense? Does it tame a sort of chaos in making you say what you couldn't say otherwise in, in other means? I think temporarily it does. I think mm -hmm. it's, I don't think it's permanent. Um, uh -huh. But I've learned, um, I've learned a kind of stillness, I think, through these experiences and um, um, a sort of personal stillness, um, which I didn't expect, really because it mm -hmm. it is so it is so traumatic but but um yeah so i would I, I would say there's a sort of cessation of chaos but not not a permanent ceasing of it for right. me right you know but i i can't you know i can't go around just being unable to you know function because of my worry so you know it, it's helpful to use words to just draw everything into a kind of still space so if that's mm -hmm. alchemy I'm grateful for it but I, I'm not sure and thank you for sharing this space with us here and with everybody else who read your beautiful poem in Indelible Fiona thank, thank you. you thank you Rula thank you and um, any other questions can't see any hands up uh, but again, feel free to just say something without raising your hand. It's absolutely okay. We're all sharing one Zoom room here. <laughs> I had a question for Sam. Um, just wanted to hear more about your new book. Uh, it's it's multilingual. Is that right? Is it in German and Arabic and English or German? Um, there's no Arabic. Um, there's one English? poem that I translated from Arabic into English that got translated into German. Um, but it's a bilingual book with counter translations for um, for each language. Um, so all the poems that I write in English were translated into German. All the poems I've written in German were translated into English um, uh, by a cater of um, really um, fantastic colleagues um, here in the German literature industry. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> what would you what would you like to know? Um, well, that's that's fascinating. How was that uh, experience for you? The the trans the intertrans because you know both languages, and yet someone else translated your poems um, into each. So just wanted to hear about your experience. Um, it was a it was quite a fruitful experience. I didn't have much input um, because we wanted kind of this to be a, kind of a collage of voices um, that still um, kind of highlights uh, um, or, or actually works on like variations on a theme basically because as you know if you give um, two people the same text they will end up with three or four different translations um, so this was kind of a collective effort in bringing it into the German market whereas the English poems are kind of um, I guess more raw in that sense um, simply because um uh, it's kind of the the language I taught myself at a very early age and has um, stayed with me for for quite a long time. Um, and this this also is kind of a, the book is kind of trying to perform its content as well, um, since I exist, so to speak, translingually um, and have existed translingually throughout my entire life, kind of um, thinking in different thoughts and compartmentalizing different emotions in different languages. Um, so this book was kind of also like Fiona said, is a way to kind of sort out the mess 
um, and put in all of these different compartmentalized thoughts into one cohesive work. Um, and so that, that's that been ultimately the experience. Um, thank you for your question. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, and thank you, Shadda, for the question. Uh, I see Bernard has a hand up. I, well, I, it's, it's just a comment, really. Uh, I just want to say, uh, I, I just all the poems today, uh, tonight, extraordinary. Um, um, I was struck by how much the delivery and how much um, the delivery added to uh, my understanding of the poetry. Uh, uh, it's the first time I've really felt that with a Zoom uh, occasion like this. The poetry was was so enhanced by the way it was read and by this form. You know, I've seen a lot of performance poetry over the years when people struck their stuff, but it, it didn't feel like that tonight. It felt really intimate. Um, strength of everybody's work uniquely came through. Um, and thank you so much to all the people who read. I thought it was. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Bernard, for the wonderful comments. And uh, would anyone else like to um, chime in? All right. I have a question for Italo. Um, Italo, so how long did it take you to write this collection? And is it all focused on the one experience of, of eating disorders? Um, so it's all part of like my PhD collection, actually, because yeah. um, I have I have completed my MA in Lancaster and now I'm doing a PhD with Andrew McMillan and Manchester Metropolitan. Um, so, yeah, my my PhD is actually not looking strictly um, at disordered eating, but also at trauma in general. So it's mm -hmm. all, it's like the old project stems from the attempt to find a critical and cre a creative language to articulate deeply distressing experience. And mm -hmm. obviously a lot of that is also devoted to my own experience with body image, uh, eating, food, nutrition, and the like um so obviously all of the things that i've been reading tonight are all part of this longer uh piece of work which is the phd so yeah mm -hmm. it's all an attempt to try to articulate what by many critics has been said like a sort of unclaimed experience to quote Cathy Ruth. so something that is unspeakable or a uh, beyond articulation, beyond any linguistics control, such as a deeply traumatic experience. So that's where my intention comes in. Wow, and I love how it's a creative uh, PhD as well. Yeah, yeah, and, definitely. Um, and I was wondering, like, how does it help you deal with the issue? Or does it at all? Um. So I think that for me, um, it's quite interesting because there's a little bit of temporal distance between the mm -hmm. issue and the writing, which I think is very helpful, uh, mm -hmm. personally speaking, because while I was really struggling, I felt like, yeah, I was writing, but I was unable to write in such a sort of like complex and multifaceted way it was mostly diaristic because that was the only way to let it all out and sort of vent vent it and get it out of my system so I think that mm -hmm. having that sort of space of um I think around 18 months or not 18 I think 14 months or something mm -hmm. has given me more clarity and sort of like more perspective on the problem I've also been reading quite extensively on um, disordered eating and the history of it, the way it also connected with religion and fasting, marath marathon yes. fasting in the Middle Ages. So it's been very, very interesting and very fascinating to read 
so extensively and trying to also uh, cement my understanding of the problem and work through the problem as I'm reading and writing and thinking and reflective creatively and critically. That is amazing. I mean, that's also so much arts-based research when your poems are also your modes of knowledge. They're also your research journey. And they're also a wonderful way to explore yourself. So thank you for sharing it with us, Itelo. I was very happy that you were also, um, you had a few other poems to read. So that was great. And um, thank you so much. We hope that you join us again soon. Oh, that would be lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, let me see, any anybody here in the chat box? No, I see some comments, but I don't see any questions. No, uh, Fiona, really? yes. Hi, yeah. Um, could, could I ask uh, Shadab a question? Is that okay? Sure, I'm here. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I mean, I loved listening to you read. Uh, it's just wonderful mental images as, as you're reading as well as some quite terrifying images too uh, and I just wondered if you could say a bit more about the the Sufi connection you you did mention that um but that, I'm just curious <laughs> so I've been interested in mysticism uh, of all kinds for a long long time but in the past few years and I think it was a sort of a, it was a gift of the pandemic when I had more time I uh, took some courses on Rumi's poetry and I just read I had time to read uh, Sufi poetry deeply and so get into you know get into into the more um, you know uh, some some of the cultural tropes, some of the spiritual um, ideas. So just deeper into it. So recently, I've been I've been writing a series of poems. And last year, I got to go to Konya to Rumi's tomb to see Rumi's tomb, and um, I got to meet. Uh, actually, got to meet um, Rumi's twenty third generation great granddaughter. So and her daughter as well. So she runs the Rumi Foundation in Konya, and it was amazing to meet Rumi's family. So of course, by now, you know, in 800 years, he's got thousands of family members all over the world. But um, uh, since Rumi's own lineage is a Sufi lineage, his father was a Sufi, his son was a Sufi. So uh, there's a Sufi order that was formed around Rumi's poetry. All of that is very fascinating to me, you know, that now uh, it's a, a Sufi order that was sort of centered on, on spiritual learning has such um, important uh, connections with the world of the fine arts. So poetry is only one. It's also calligraphy and, um, and all kinds of book binding, uh, all kinds of very beautiful crafts, you know, fine arts. And, and craft that are associated with, with the spiritual order. So, so my own poems are in response to what I read. So I read Hafiz and, you know, Bulle Shah and other poets as well. Other poets in other languages that are also Sufi poets. And uh, my poems are, my, my response, you know, it's a contemporary, you know, uh, contemporary response. And uh, most of my poems are sort of, they use some of the classical tropes and metaphors, but of course they're sort of like filtered through my own life and my own uh, sort of uh, the, the world that I inhabit, you know, the, the here and now. So, so they, they're sort of in response to something that is a tradition that's been around for, you know, for nearly 1400 years. But uh, over o over time, it's sort of changed and shifted. And the best of this tradition speaks to us very clearly even today. Like Rumi's poetry is just crystal clear, you know. You and the way he uses metaphors, and this is uh, this is across cultures, across languages, and you know, people argue that you there's no way to really translate mm, Rumi's. Farsi poetry into English, but I think that I think that it 
comes across, I read the Farsi too. That's another recent project that I'm trying to get into the original Persian, uh, which I, I have access to because Urdu uses the same script and and literary Urdu uses also uses the, some of the same metaphors as as uh, classical Persian poetry. So so um, I feel that so much of it is just so close to the human experience even today it sounds contemporary and a good translation will make it even more so it will bring out that aspect of the poetry so this is just something that you know this is i shared my latest poems because i just feel like that's where i am in life right now i feel like you know i've moved on from the older books and i i feel like uh you know um the way i've been responding to events in the past year or so has been to see things from this from this filter of mm. of uh, you know the sufi spir spirituality yeah. yeah thank you for that I, question Fiona. No, i i think that's that's amazing and I, I've, your answer is so clear as well and it's the for me it's the clarity of the image you know that i could sort of see here in your in your work it's wonderful thank you thank you for that thank you thanks Thank you so much, uh, Fiona and Shadab. Um, I just found Yuana's email in my spam inbox and other emails from you too. So first of all, I'm really sorry because I don't know what's going on with my inboxes today. Um, I need to send an email twice because it's I'm considered spam now. I don't know why. <laughs> and I'm also receiving emails in my um, to my junk email. So uh, Yuan is having connection problems, but she had anticipated this before, so she pre-recorded her reading. She's with us now, but she, I mean, we won't be able to hear her, but we can actually uh, play her video. So this is what I'll be doing now. I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, please let me know if you can hear the video. So... Okay, I think I found it again. Right, can you see it? Hello, Yuan, I know you can hear us. We can't hear you, but uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm so glad that you managed to record the reading beforehand. And, oh, I think I needed to choose the um uh, the special format for videos here yeah share sound and now i can play it again okay and i'll mute myself hi this is my poem web web we spin polymide film and beryllium into sun shields thin as hair set gold mirror to sail on armed ships <laughs> With the river dredge, the whites of fish eyes look like scattered stars. Their bodies flop on muddy banks, overshot by billions, rockets launch, ripping into space. Silver dollars and catfish behold their final sky, and through the biggest telescope, we will see further than any, to the vanishing point, to the infinite, to ourselves staring right back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iwana. That was beautiful hearing you read it and seeing you, although it's um, it's via video, but we look forward to having you with us next time. Um, it's amazing how the telescope is so inspiring in many different ways, especially to poets. And if you would like to, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Iwana. Uh, if you don't have her email, um, you could just ask me and I can connect you. Um, but thank you so much, Ioana. We really appreciate that you're here and you did not give up on the technological challenges. So thank you. Um, and I guess we have room for one more question before we close the session. All right, so if no one has a question, I might as well uh, go ahead and ask Derek. Uh, Derek, what inspired you to write this poem? It's nice of you to ask. Um, I, th I think uh, I was probably supposed to be doing something else. And so instead of 
grading or working on what I was supposed to be working on, I I was moved to to watch the uh, the minor activity of the bouquet that was actually on our kitchen table and and watch it act out. And so I I mused on that a little bit. That's all. Well, that's amazing. And I can relate to that so well. Um, during the past few years, before I moved to London, I used to write poems during staff meetings. Um, oh. well, it doesn't matter if they hear it now, or if they find out, I mean, I'm not there anymore. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yes, there's something so inspiring about having to do something and not wanting to do it. Because, again, um, this is how the creativity arises out of tension. Um, to borrow from W.B. Yeats and Carl Jung, this is how things happen. So out of the antinomies and tension between the two. So uh, thank you all. This has been beautiful. This has been brilliant. Uh, this has taken us into a journey deep into the depths of our spirit, our world, our hopes, our fears. And there's so much beauty in everything around us, even in the darkest times. And I'm so happy that you were able to articulate it and share it with us uh, through indelible and through indelible evenings. Um, so this is the very last session that we have this year, but we certainly have a lot more coming up soon. Um, we have indelible evenings at least once a month. We have site creative at least once a month. So for those who don't know what site creative is, it is a monthly get together that's not for Jungians exceptionally, it's for everybody, but we do have a Jungian guest during the first half of the session uh, talking about a specific theme that relates to Jungian or post-Jungian psychology and creativity. Um, our most recent one two days ago was about writing your personal myth using archetypal astrology. So, and, and Jung did a lot of astrology work. So it was fascinating to see how we could be creative with that. Um, and uh, we also have workshops, we have conferences and we have lots of other events. So uh, please stay in touch. If you haven't subscribed to us yet, please do. We also have two YouTube channels. So if you wanna catch up on any site creative sessions that you've missed or indelible evening sessions, then you can find them there. They're two different channels. One is called indelible evenings. The other one is called site creative. And our submissions window for indelible number eight is open until the 31st of January. Uh, and the theme is not too far from science and sensibility, except that science is part of it. But this is about creativity as a mode for knowledge. So any of the sciences, any of the so-called scientific disciplines or non-scientific disciplines, whether it's architecture, science, uh, math, I mean, anything, how we can create poetry from that and how one also leads to the other. How also writing poems, for example, what Italo just shared with us about his experience in writing his, his poems is that it also teaches us. So basically creativity is a mode for knowledge and other disciplines are also very inspirational and poetic, although they are not often conventionally seen in that mode. So uh, yes, it is open. Uh, we have the submissions tab ready for all the information on our website and it'll be there until the 31st of January. Uh, and for those of you, again, who are interested in our conferences, the one that we have coming up next is an online conference on February 7 and 8. And it's about fiction and nonfiction and blurring the boundaries in between. So whether you're a scholar or a writer, uh, you're welcome to submit your work. And uh, February 24-25 will be a hybrid conference at Cambridge University, so it'll both be online and in Cambridge, and the theme is Modernism Remodeled. So for all those modernists out there, Fiona, hello, <laughs> you may want to pass the word. Um, and also anyone who sees today as an extension and as a continuation to modernism. So is modernism really over yet? Are we living a second wave of modernism? Is the interwar period still an interwar period? Because as we can see, I mean, the world wars are not really over yet. So if you would like to explore any of those themes through poems, through art, through academic and scholarly work, 
uh, music whatsoever, again, please send us your proposals. Uh, March is for women who create. And of course, you do not necessarily have to be a woman to write about women. So don't be a stranger and send us anything that you would like about creative women by creative women. Um, and anything that excavates this whole mine of, you know, what women do and what they have done to change the world and what they continue to do for that. Uh, and lots more from last year are also going to be having their seconds this year as well. So again, stay in touch, follow us on social media, sign up for our newsletter, uh, and you will hear all about what's coming up. And I want to wish everybody a happy holiday season, Christmas, New Year, and we all want to wish the world a, a better year ahead. And it's precisely because of that, that we should never stop imagining. We should never stop creating uh, with the hope that it will make the world a better place and it will build bridges rather than burn them. So thank you again for being here. So much love to you all and see you again very soon. Bye-bye.